You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Alex Howe. Alex Howe received a PhD in astrophysics from Princeton University in 2016 and is currently a postdoc at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. His research centers around the atmospheres of extrasolar planets, particularly with regard to determining what they are made of. Alex has also written several science fiction books and short stories that he has posted on his blog, along with longer, non-fiction essays that don't fit into a single post. He also has a YouTube channel where he discusses science and science fiction. Link in the description below. Alex Howe, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Alex, you wrote about a year ago a very intriguing paper, Cloud Continents, Terraforming Venus Efficiently by Means of a Floating Artificial Surface. And this is one of those great big ideas that I love that come from science at perhaps the behest of science fiction. And I know you're a big science fiction fan, as am I. Now, this idea of terraforming Venus is going to sound big at first, but not in comparison to the other ideas that have been floated in the past. And it may be it may be that Venus is a rising star as far as terraforming as opposed to Mars, which always seemed like the obvious place to start for this. But maybe it's not. So give us an overview of your idea of cloud continents on Venus and how that's different in relation to past ideas. Okay, so the issue with terraforming Venus at first glance is that Venus's surface seems very unearth-like. It has 90 times Earth's atmospheric pressure. It's around 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which I like to say is as hot as a pizza oven. And it seems like it would be very difficult to overcome those things. But what has been recognized for a while is that if you go up about 50 kilometers, that's 30 miles above the surface, you get a region where the atmospheric temperature and pressure are both pretty close to Earth's surface. And so, obviously, there's no oxygen there and there are the sulfuric acid clouds, but you wouldn't need a full space suit to live there. You would just need an oxygen supply, protection from the acid, and an airship. And this is something that has been proposed just as a concept, not as a serious mission, but it's called Havoc. And this was a proposal to colonize Venus's upper atmosphere. And I was aware of this, and I was also aware of the other proposals for terraforming Venus, and I realized, you know, you could expand the airship concept to simply enclose the entire planet. And and I should add, there's uh, one more piece to the puzzle, which is Venus's atmosphere is carbon dioxide, and that means Earth air, which is nitrogen and oxygen, is lighter and would be a lifting gas on Venus. So you wouldn't need large amounts of helium to make a large floating city on Venus. You could just extract nitrogen from the local atmosphere. So essentially you concentrate the nitrogen that's already there. Now, the oxygen, presumably, you can get from the sulfuric acid, right? You get oxygen from the carbon dioxide. I misspoke, yeah, the carbon dioxide. Now, is there enough there, though, to be able to split that? And do you have the energy to split that? Or is it better to transport water from somewhere else and start with that? Or is it better to just transport actual oxygen? So in other words, I mean, how do you start getting the oxygen that you need to produce the lighter than air effect along with the nitrogen? Right. So the first thing is transporting material across interplanetary distances is something you want to minimize because that takes a lot of energy. And... Venus is closer to the sun, so that means there's abundant solar power there, and there's plenty of solar power, if you have a few decades to spare, to split enough carbon dioxide to get the oxygen you need for a breathable atmosphere. Now, when you get to that, now that you say a few decades, how much energy are we talking about and how do we collect it in order to do that? Well, this is why this is a big idea. The energy we're talking about is what you would get by covering a large fraction of the planet in solar panels. 
But with your idea, you're creating that large fraction. Or would you have to do it in orbit? I mean, could you build an orbital system to collect solar energy and essentially beam it back down? Or would you, would you do that first? Or would you start building your floating continent, essentially, using the lighter than air effect to try to start small? You're starting with an aerostat, and then you get bigger and bigger and start building it that way. What's that profile look like to get the process going? Well, you start with what I call tiles, which are these aerostats, I modeled them as being about 100 meters wide, so a little larger than a football field, but they can be pretty much any size you want. You start by building this floating continent. For just the aerostats, you don't need that much lifting gas, so you don't need that much power. And you just put solar panels on the top and use those to generate power, and you can use that to crack the carbon dioxide into carbon and oxygen. Now, the carbon itself is useful, right? So you can use that to perhaps begin to create more of your tiles, right? Right. So my idea hinges in large part on being able to produce carbon nanotubes in bulk. I'm pretty sure that even the demonstrated properties of carbon nanotubes are strong enough to build this surface, but we don't have the technology yet to produce them in bulk. Now, what would these these look like built of carbon nanotubes? Would it be more like an actual rigid object, like a, a kind of dirigible, I guess, as opposed to a sort of balloon? Yeah, and people might make that comparison, but it might not be right because it's hard to build on a balloon as opposed to a solid surface. So these carbon nanotube surfaces, very light, and we're already playing with these materials. We haven't quite got there yet, but we're playing with them, might produce just a, a true island that you could build something on, right? Right. I should clarify, there are two parts to the surface. One is just this layer of tiles, which may only be a few yards thick, a few meters thick, and is only there to enclose the atmosphere and separate from the upper part from the lower part. And those would be more like a balloon. They can be very thin as long as they're strong enough to stand up to the winds. Then underneath that, you build a rigid structure with the carbon nanotubes, and that is going to be much thicker and able to support more weight on top of it. So that's where you'd get these floating islands and eventually floating continents. So what do you need to do to begin this? I mean, is there a certain size that you need to start the process to, to begin to even just combat the winds? I mean, what does that look like at 50 kilometers in the Venusian atmosphere? That's a little outside my expertise, but I looked at the average wind speeds and... At that altitude, they're not that high. If you go, I believe it's higher up, you have jet stream type winds. But at 50 kilometers, the winds are fairly mild and the physics is probably on the same order of magnitude as dealing with airships on Earth. So doable in that in that context. So it shouldn't and not really asking too much. Mm -hmm. Now, once you did this and you could enclose Venus in a shell of these objects, variable thickness shell, and you can start to really colonize it and do something with it. What do you have to do in order to separate the Venusian atmosphere below you, which is holding you up, versus the air you're breathing or, or you want to breathe to eventually be able to breathe? So how do you have to do this? I mean, does that have to be perfectly sealed to prevent any sort of problems with the mixing of the two atmospheres? It has to be pretty close to perfectly sealed, at least on a planetary scale. I would expect there would be rips that occur, but ideally you would have a fleet of repair drones of some sort that could repair them before they become a serious problem. But but again, since you're dealing with a, an area of pressure similar to Earth, I mean, a micro meteorite hole in one of these things probably isn't going to be a big deal, right? Right, but also you, micro meteorites are not going to get through the upper atmosphere because the upper atmosphere is still as thick as Earth's. Right, so you've got good protection, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Now, the next question about that, though, is, all right, so you get this built and you, you know, you've got this giant enclosed planet like this. First question is, is, well, what do you do with Venus's rotation? You know, that very long day that it has. Does that factor in here or is it relatively an irrelevant problem that we can fix without actually changing the rotation of the planet? The rotation of the surface is pretty much irrelevant because Venus's atmosphere exhibits super rotation, which means the atmosphere rotates faster than the surface does. And it depends exactly how this shell would interact with the prevailing winds, but it would rotate around the planet 
somewhere between every four days and about nine days, I think. So still longer than Earth, but much faster than the 117 Earth day, right. solar day that you would get on the surface. Right. So it's essentially not really so much of a problem. Now, once you get this this nitrogen and oxygen atmosphere, and then you still have access to carbon dioxide, which you can use for growing plants on the surface of this thing, you you need water. Where are you going to get the water in order to create a self-sustaining agriculture for this colony? The water is the hard part because, uh, like I said, you want to minimize the amount of material you're shipping from another planet, but Venus does not have enough water to be useful, so you have to ship it from another planet. And I considered the different options, and the one that was most energy efficient that has enough water is Mars. Yeah, and this is a bigger problem than people might think in that launching water <laughs> off the surface of the Earth is not efficient. But what of something like, I don't know, a comet or something like that and creating some kind of a mass driver or some efficient system of sending water towards Venus? What do you do once it gets there? Do you just let it vaporize in the atmosphere and rain? Yes, pretty much. You would have to move it in small enough chunks that it would vaporize in the atmosphere. There may be a few comets that are in favorable orbits to move water to Venus efficiently, but I don't think there would be enough water in those because you need not a whole ocean's worth, but you need a cube, I think it was about 50 kilometers on a side, and that's a little larger than most comets. So Mars is a better option, and there we're talking about a space elevator. Could you explain that concept of building a water-lifting space elevator on Mars in order to bring it to Venus? Yes. So the concept of a space elevator is to just have a very long tether extending upward from the equator of the planet, from the surface of the planet on the equator, and that will rotate with the planet, and if it's a short tether, it'll just fall down. But if it's a long tether that extends past the synchronous orbit, then the centrifugal force, which is a real force in a rotating reference frame, will hold the tether taut so that it'll, it'll stay up. And you can, again, with solar panels, would be the easiest way, pump water up a pipe from the surface to the end of the tether, or you could put it on some kind of maglev truck and when it gets to the end of the tether, because it's outside the synchronous orbit, but still rotating with the planet, it will be moving faster than the synchronous orbit, and that lets you get it to escape velocity for free. And then you can essentially, once your, your elevator is going back down to the surface of Mars, you can recover most of your energy, right? So that whatever you put into lifting, you can get quite a bit back from it descending, wouldn't you think? Well, I mean, you get energy back from the truck descending if you're using some sort of truck, but you still lose the energy of the water you release to Venus. When you get that water there and it's in that system, would it be feasible, you know, what does recycling of the water look like? I mean, is it going to get broke down progressively by interaction with the sun? You know, is it, what's it going to do as that water is sitting in that system, raining down onto the uh, artificial surface? Can we create that very efficiently to where we reuse that water as best we can? But would Venus always be dependent on a supply of water from elsewhere? Uh, no. As long as the artificial surface, the cloud contents, are intact, then the idea is that you set up a water cycle on Venus similar to the one we have on Earth. Now, you would not be moving a whole ocean's worth of water, so you would not have the large reservoir of water that is our lakes and oceans, but there would be enough to have an atmospheric water cycle. Now, that would be very artificial, though. How do you, uh, where do you do from the ground? I mean, is it simply going to, as you irrigate your crops, is it going to just evaporate and create an actual water cycle? I mean, will it just it rain, uh, essentially, and that do it on its own? Or will we have to intervene technologically to keep that process going? The idea is that it should evaporate and then fall as rain, just like it does on Earth. Because the idea is to create an Earth-like environment in this upper atmosphere. Now let's look at some of the ideas from the past. So I remember the probably one of the earliest, if not the earliest, idea of terraforming Venus came from Carl Sagan, as I recall. 
where the idea was to chemically change it. Now, we know that this was before we really even knew enough about Venus to even say, but this idea of chemically changing it has been around for a long time, but it never really got traction as opposed to Mars. Why do you think that Venus, given that it already hosts the most Earth-like environment off Earth in the solar system, why do you think that was? Why do you think that there was a preference towards Mars these decades as opposed to taking a serious look at Venus? I think the reason is that we realized how hostile the surface of Venus was, which seemed to make any of the previous terraforming ideas completely infeasible. I don't know when it was that we learned there was this habitable-ish layer in the upper atmosphere. It might have been when Magellan went through there in the late 80s, early 90s, was it? Around that time, yeah. So I'm not sure if we even knew this was a possibility for several decades there. There was some work, though. Um, I know uh, Grinspoon and a few other people were doing some work back in the 90s that you could maybe start sequestering the CO2 and doing these things. But this idea seems much more, much more feasible. But I got another question, sort of an off the wall one. If you were to put Venus, planet like Venus, which we know are probably not rare in the universe, you know, they're probably out there. Situations where you're a little too close to your sun and no longer in the habitable zone. So if you start seeing some kind of a signature of this where you have an entire planet encased, you know, in aerostats like this, that would seem very unnatural and a techno signature, wouldn't you think? That would be a techno signature. Now, there are a lot of caveats to that. One of the biggest ones is that with both biosignatures, which are signs of life, and techno signatures, which are signs of technology on exoplanets, we have to make sure there is no natural process that can mimic those. For example, there are some theories, not one theory among many, that Venus was habitable as recently as half a billion years ago. So if you just see life on a planet in a Venus-like orbit, that's not necessarily a techno signature. But if you see, and I don't even know if this is something we could detect, but if you see life plus silicon signatures from mass solar panels or something like that, that would be a stronger techno signature. Now, necessarily, you would have a very robust array of solar panels on something like this because that's where your energy is coming from, right? So you could actually have that that huge silicon <laughs> signature reflection or something along with something weird like a red edge in infrared that, that suggests that you've got really unnatural combo here <laughs> that you really shouldn't be seeing, especially from a planet that seems a little too close to its sun. But that's, of course, not something that you can really count on because those things can be debated. But the idea is, is there, the core idea that maybe there is a techno signature in this. The, the, you could call it the unnatural planet, right? I suppose you could. Now, next step. How do we get the ball rolling as far as thinking at this point in time with our technology, thinking about how to possibly eventually terraform Mars? Do you think it actually starts with Earth when, as we try to solve the problems here on Earth, could those technologies that we develop, things like fusion energy and you know things like that, be the beginning of the roadmap to eventually, centuries from now, thinking about doing this with Venus? Yes, I, I think so. Of course, geoengineering to modify Earth's climate has been an idea that's kind of been on the back burner for quite a while. If there is catastrophic climate change that we're not able to handle with lesser measures, it's kind of seen as a last resort, I think, but the fact that we are having this discussion about climate change and CO2 levels in the atmosphere means we are doing some degree of geoengineering or atmospheric engineering, and those are lessons that we could, in a couple hundred years, take to Venus. And, of course, new technology, carbon nanotubes, maybe fusion, although I went with solar power in, in my idea, those are sort of prerequisites for a large terraforming operation like this. Well, we, <laughs> yeah, I guess the question about fusion is that, do you have the fuel there? But when you're talking about solar energy, obviously we, the materials you need for that are there. Now, tell us about your podcast. So I produce a podcast called A Reader's History of Science Fiction, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, about 10 years ago, I started a personal project of reading all of the classics of science fiction. And it was late 2019 when I finally got through my list because there were over 100 books on it. And I decided this was something I could produce a podcast about. And uh, I spent some time preparing and planning and I eventually launched it in 
uh, I believe, April of 2020. And that's been going for three years now. I uh, post every two weeks and I'm actually close to wrapping it up. There's only a couple more episodes. Oh, really? So you had a you had an end game with that? Yes. All right. Tell us about some of your favorites. What's what in what in the world of science fiction, especially in books, really got you going and really made you as a scientist say that's a really neat idea? Well, I tend to think of it more in narrative terms. Obviously, there are some very neat ideas in science fiction, but the ones that really get me going are the ones that have a good story. The ones I like most, and I've seen it done well, and I've seen it done not so well, but there are stories that have a big world behind them that kind of throw you in the deep end of a world that's different from ours and leave you to figure out what's going on as you go. And the first one I like that I read was Existence by David Brin. And then I later encountered a couple others. John Brunner's Stand on Zanzibar was a good example. And it's those kinds of really immersive stories that really inspire me. So the rich world, as opposed to sometimes getting a little too bit too too far into the nuts and bolts, which is good as long as you've got a good story behind it. But if you just leave it on or note it on its own, it can sort of ring hollow as far as the storytelling. At least I've seen. Mm-hmm. All right, Alex, thanks for joining us. And everybody can find your YouTube channel and your uh, where, where exactly can they go on here on YouTube? My YouTube channel and my blog are both called Science Meets Fiction. And if you search for Science Meets Fiction it should come up pretty high on the list. And there will be links to both in the description below. Thanks, Alex. It was great talking to you. Thanks again for having me on. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.